Good evening, everyone. We are live streaming on Facebook this evening. Um, so we're uh, going to get started now. We um, would like the speakers to hold a little bit still if you can, because uh, <laughs> last time we uh, had some difficulties finding on our Facebook live stream, we had some difficulties finding the speaker and the slides and other things. So just remember that you are live streaming tonight, and we're going to be uh, posting this um, on our YouTube channel and promoting it as much as we can. My name is Ruth Stemmler, and I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Boulder County, and we're very proud to see all of, here, all of you here this evening. Thank you to our co-sponsors, um, the Lafayette Library, Ranked Choice Voting, and Approval Voting USA. The mission of the League of Women Voters is to encourage the informed and active participation of citizens in government, work to increase understanding of major public policy, policy issues, and influence public policy through education and advocacy. We are nonpartisan, never endorsing a political party or candidate. We are 100% volunteers, and the League is not for women only. So men, please join us. Our emphasis this year is voter education and services, money and politics, and voting methods. That's what brings us here tonight. We invite you to check out our website at lwbbc.org, to follow us on Facebook, and to join us on Meetup. Upcoming is our new Drinks and Dialogue series. On March the 6th, we will be discussing redistricting, and on April the 3rd, we will be discussing voter suppression. So please join us those evenings uh, for our new Drinks and Dialogue series. Become a member and help us empower citizens to make better communities. We have some donation boxes around it, around the room. If you're so inclined, we invite you to make a voluntary donation. Um, and now I'm going to stop the commercial message. No more commercial message. Some basic rules before I introduce the first speaker, which is Neil. Uh, Neil will give his presentation first, and then um, Jonathan will be second. Each presenter has about 20 to 25 minutes. Um, Neil has said they might go back and forth a little bit, and that's fine. Question and answer session will be at the conclusion of both presentations. So um, we have um, some ushers around the room. Please raise your hand if you're an usher. We're gonna do written questions again tonight. Um, and then um, Celeste Landry, Celeste, give us a wave is our voting methods team leader, and she is going to moderate the question and answer session. So now I will introduce Neil. Neil McVernon is a longtime city, city of Boulder resident with a computer <coughs> science degree from Brown and one from UC Berkeley. He is an independent consultant in data science and election integrity. He is well known for his work on election audits in Boulder County as, and has consulted with the state of Colorado to improve election audits at the state level. Neil is also one of seven board members of the Center for Election Science. The seven members have live in six different states and one foreign country, so we are lucky to have one of them right here in Boulder County. The Center for Election Science is dedicated to helping the world make smarter collective decisions. In particular, CES is the largest organization advocating for approval voting, a simple alternative to plurality voting for single winner elections. In 1995, Neil put up the first web pages with detailed information about approval voting. Please welcome Neil. Mm, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. One never knows how one will be introduced. That's lovely. <laughs> Um, and uh, thank you to the League, really, this is uh, an honor, and I'm so impressed at what the League has been doing for many years now, just with election methods. I was a member of the League for many years, and uh, during that period of time, I don't think we talked about that a lot, and then uh, lots of stuff happened while I was off doing auditing work, so it's, it's a real uh, delight to see the 37-page document that Celeste just came out recently, and just to see the work that uh, Celeste and Steele and um, Diana and so many other uh, members of the group have been 
things together. So um, I got interested in approval voting way back in 1980s and did find uh, some of those materials and put them up in 1995, which back when the web was young and all. So it was uh, great to see progress since then. So uh, we're going to do this in, uh, in sync here. So if we move on to the next thing, just a little bit more about the Center for Election Science. I'm new on the board just since last summer. Uh, it is a nonprofit. And besides researching, uh, improving, uh, how to improve methods for voting, it also disseminates best practices, <coughs> builds a community, and there's a very active community of uh, people in the election science Google mail group that discusses many more weeds than we're going to have any time to even think about <laughs> today. Um, and also does software development and does uh, consulting with individual organizations that want to have an election method that's tailored to their particular needs. So I won't be covering that sort of material, but I just wanted to give you a sense for what else the Center for Election Science does. So for the next slide uh, is basically an overview of the material that I'll try to cover. And most of the material on this slide, I think, is really consensus. I think the previous speaker from a couple weeks ago, Rob Ritchie, would agree with what's on this slide. I think a lot of people uh, understand that the voting method that we use in the United States causes a lot of problems. There are a lot of other problems with elections that uh, the league deals with in various ways and that we can also talk about, but today we're going to focus on method. Approval voting is this one method that I think is so obviously simple and easy as an upgrade to be available to do single winner elections. I'll also talk about other single winner methods and touch on the fact that again, I think there's widespread agreement that proportional representation is the best way to allow a legislative body or a council to represent <coughs> citizens. And again, really make sure that every citizen feels that there is a voice for them in you know, the halls of power, as it were. So that's a brief overview of uh, what we'll talk about today. Briefly then on the issues with the voting method, um, there's not even a good well-known term for the way that we do elections. A lot of people just assume it's the only thing that exists, but we'll typically call it plurality voting. Um, we like to use the term choose one plurality voting because in some sense approval voting is a plurality method in that you take whoever gets the largest number of votes. But emphasizing the fact that you only get to choose one. You have to pick among all the choices one uh, candidate or option to vote for. Also sometimes called first past the post. It's a horse race and whoever uh, just happen to barely beat the others, even if they're not a majority or not a very big uh, proportion, nevertheless wins in our current system. And the most obvious problem with that is the spoiler effect. So we see that uh, when there is an existing field and a new person wants to enter the field and become a candidate, it almost doesn't matter how good they are as a candidate. The existing people in the field are afraid of the fact that, especially if, one, if they're close ideologically to somebody who's already in the field, they're afraid that the vote will be split, that the spoiler will drain off votes because you can you have to pick between this spoiler and the other person. And they'll drain off votes and maybe allow someone else who really doesn't have majority of support, doesn't even, uh, wouldn't win one-to-one -one against the other candidates might end up actually winning the race. And of course that happens all the time and in our lives of voting in elections, we're all familiar with times of that. And so this leads us to, for perverse reasons, be met at the candidate who wants to run rather than at the voting system that set us up for the problem in the first place. And the people who want to vote for that candidate get accused of wasting their vote and not you know, voting for the, the lesser of two evils instead of voting for the person they really believe in. So we set up these imbalances just by the way, the way the election system is set up. I think it also leads to negative campaigning. 
and good candidates avoid running because they're not they're afraid of all those accusations and maybe they're kind of happy enough with whoever is there already and then voters seeing the whole situation get disillusioned stop turning out and the whole legitimacy of, of the election is at risk and another point that I really want to make that all of the other voting systems that we talk about improve on is how much we learn about what the electorate really wants we learn only who somebody's strategic first choice is we don't have any idea who their second choice would be we don't have any idea who they would settle for we only know that they made some strategic choice and they decided to vote usually for one of the front lines and that's really not a way to find out what people care about in democracy. So the next slide will very briefly uh, introduce and uh, also show you a video of approval voting. So why don't we run the video at this point. What is approval voting? Simply put, it's a better way to run an election. Let's take a trip to Plantsville. It's election time, and Mayor Blueberry is campaigning hard for a second term in office. She won the last election with 65% against her opponent, Mr. Squash, and she still enjoys strong support. Once again, Mr. Squash is quick to challenge Ms. Blueberry, but this time they're joined by a third challenger, Mr. Peach, who shares similar views with Mayor Blueberry. Mr. Peach sweet talks almost half of Blueberry's supporters into switching their vote to him while Mr. Squash holds the same 35% he had last time. The votes are counted. And what's this? Mr. Squash wins? Blueberry and Peach have split the fruit vote. How did this happen? Peach's supporters also like Blueberry, but couldn't say so on their ballot. A simple solution is to change the ballot from vote for one to vote for one or more, allowing everyone to state all the candidates they support. This is called approval voting. With approval voting, the election would have gone quite differently. Peach's supporters no longer fear that a vote for Peach will help elect Squash. Instead, they show their sincere support for Peach and also Blueberry. They want to prevent Mr. Squash from winning, and they do. And approval voting accurately reflects Peach's support. Mayor Blueberry wins the election. Democracy is restored. Approval voting is more than just a smart idea in Plantsville. It's a smart idea anywhere you vote. Approval voting is used by organizations across the globe, and for good reason. It's democratic because the candidate with the most support wins. Even losing candidates get an accurate reflection of support. And voting your favorite never hurts you. Start the conversation on approval voting and share We're essentially done, so go ahead and go back. Yeah, okay. it's exactly done. Okay, so um, that video, by the way, is available right on the front of the uh, election science electology.org uh, website. So, um, and it just serves as a, as a simple nonpartisan introduction to the whole thing. And so, as you see, we have ballots that we're very familiar with. We can have a bunch of candidates. There's only one way to mark each. Um, candidate, but you can mark, as you see uh, up there, uh, one or more marks uh, for one or more candidates, and you still add it up the same way. Every mark is a full vote, and whoever gets the most votes wins. You're probably familiar with this from city council races, where you can vote for up to five, and they all count the same. We're not talking fractional votes. We're not talking uh, complex arithmetic. It's just a matter of giving your support, approving of as many as you want. So uh, let's go on to the next slide. And I'll just point out a couple different uh, advantages. First of all, it's really very similar to what we do today. The standard election systems that we use can all tally an approval voting election. You can add them up in precincts and total the precincts up in counties and total the counties up at the state. It's a very straightforward uh, approach. 
you get to show support for anybody that you want to show support for, so we hear more about what you as a voter are interested in. I think it also leads to more positive elections, the very name approval voting and the very fact that the main thing you're doing is approving for people, approving of people, means that candidates want your approval. They can't get away with saying, you've got to vote for me because uh, otherwise you're going to end up with my evil opponent, right? Not always. I mean, it will certainly be the case that there will be acrimony uh, pie in the sky, but I, I think there will be more positive elections. Not only does it increase participation from voters in terms of the votes they cast, but I think more voters will come out because they'll feel that their vote will actually be heard and counted because they get to express more fully their interests, but more candidates do. So we will see less uh, reticence for candidates to offer their services. And if they're the one that uh, gets the, the greatest support, <coughs> then they'll win. I'll also point out that it's easy to audit. And some of the other systems out there are really surprisingly difficult to, uh, to come up with good evidence that the election came out the way that the uh, system announced it did. So let's go to the next slide. And uh, a little bit of history, and this was actually a surprise to many of us. It's only a year ago, I think, that uh, someone noticed in old Greek elections from 1864 to 1926 that approval voting was used in Greece for the legislature. So if you look at this picture, you'll see boxes that have uh, labels on them I would have assumed that that meant no, but no, that means yes, white is yes, <laughs> me, and ochi means no in Greek. Each candidate gets their own voting box, and each voter, there would be people behind each box with marbles, and the voters would walk by, and the, the person would give you a marble for this candidate, and you'd reach your hand in this long metal sleeve, and inside the box, you would move your hand to the left or the right, and it would drop down into either half of this box. So you would secretly vote yes or no for each of the candidates. And this is at a time when secrecy of, of uh, privacy of the ballot, anonymity of the voter, was not really that common. The Australian ballot was invented uh, sometime in the same vicinity. And so this was quite innovative in just the way they designed the, the voting system. And you would do that then for each candidate as you walk down the line. So it has been used in, uh, in other places. I think there were major disruptions in Greece uh, in the 1920s, as in so many places. So we don't yet have someone who really knows Greek well to explain all the details of how that happened, but some history there. And then if we move on to more recent history, this idea was reinvented in the 60s and 70s by several different people. And it is currently used in a number of places. Straw polls at the uh, United Nations, uh, when voting for the Secretary General, the Security Council will essentially, <coughs> and a lot of bodies can or, or, or might be doing this. You, know, you basically say, How many, raise your hands for each candidate. It's almost the same thing. Raise your hand for each candidate. I guess you just want to start the chips bar. Um, and whoever gets the most hands raised wins, right? Or you find out kind of how other people are voting. So it's a, it's a way, especially with a large field, to get that kind of sense of what's going on. It makes sense, it's intuitively. It doesn't take a lot of mathematical savvy. But people were really focused in different areas for voting, and it had to be invented with new eyes. Some of the prestigious uh, mathematical and statistical associations use it, and our own University of Colorado. Anyone here from the University of Colorado, by the way, yeah. voted in student elections on, uses an approval voting ballot. So, experience right here in the room. Um, now, a lot of you will know from studying and writing massive dissertations on voting methods, that there's a lot of controversy and a lot of mathematics and a lot of complication. And it is true that there is no, um, that you can mathematically prove that you can't 
find the perfect voting system. Most people have heard about, uh, most people who care about this area have heard about Arrow's theorem, which is incorrectly applied to approval voting. It does apply to instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting methods, um, but the way that the proof is written, it only applies to methods in which you rank someone above someone else. You can't have ties and you, you don't have this rating. So it does not apply to approval voting. And so we have a little more flexibility in terms of solving some of these uh, dilemmas. But there is another um, mathematical theorem, the Gibbard Satterweight theorem, which basically tells you, and this might not come as a big surprise, but it basically tells you that aside from some really bad options like dictatorship, strategic voting is a fact of life. People will sometimes do things with their vote to try to maximize their influence. And that's something that I think we just have to accept. So, next slide. It is, however, possible to uh, think about this in terms of what could we do that would be the very best thing. And there's a method that some colleagues of mine have used to try to assess different voting methods based on this basic idea. If we could read voters' minds, and we could really know everything about what they care about as issues, what they think about the candidates, how the candidates are portrayed in the media. Um, you could come up with, for any given election and electorate, you could come up with the candidate who, if you factor them into how happy everybody would be with them as the outcome, you could come up with a candidate who would maximize what we call the utility for the voters. The voters would say, you know, I really love that candidate, that one is really good on this issue, but not so good on that issue, et cetera, et cetera. You can come up with a happiness factor for each candidate. And you can imagine coming up with um, a method of assessing that happiness and declaring whoever it is that makes the most people the most happy. Um, and in practice, we can't do that, because neither are we going to get a ballot that's going to give your interest and your opinion on all the issues and your assessment of the candidates on all of the issues and know enough about the candidates. But we could, in, in practice, in theory, do that. And in practice, in a computer, we can simulate that. So we can make up a whole electorate in a computer, a whole set of people with different opinions. We can make up candidates. We can do that with a lot of different candidates and people and even different strategies. We can assess, we can assign to different voters in the computer different strategies. And we can see how those strategies would affect the outcome <coughs> of the election. And if you do that, well, we've had somebody who's getting a PhD at Harvard right now do that. And, uh, and I'll show you what the result looks like. And I didn't have time to make this a very friendly slide so I'm sorry you're just going to have to, to bear with me a little bit here. And I'm, I hope that I'll still be visible in, in the... So, um, and you probably can't see it closely enough. But on the bottom, which is really where it belongs, <laughs> is plurality. <laughs> and there's a bunch of methods on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis is the voter satisfaction efficiency. How efficient is the voting method at getting that answer that would represent the candidate who would make the most voters the most happy, okay? And we see that a plurality is getting ratings of maybe 70% of the time it'll find the best candidate, or maybe 75 or 80, sometimes 85. But if you run a lot of elections, which have these kinds of spoiler effects, it's very easy, and we've all experienced them in our lifetime, it's very easy to run across circumstances where a spoiler takes votes away from the person that otherwise would have won the election. And if that other person had been there, the spoiler probably would have won the election. But since they're both there, the other candidate wins. We can do a lot better, and the rest of the lines on here show just how much better we can do. 
Uh, Borda actually has another point that's about here. So if you're very, and I'm not going to talk about Borda, but if you're a fan of Borda, sometimes voters are incented to do exactly the wrong thing. And then I'm going to jump all the way up. There are two lines here for approval. And we see that they are pretty much, all the ones on the top are in the sweet spot. Pretty much. And so what are these different dots? The different dots represent degree of strategic um, calculation by the voters. So if the voters are very strategic, they might not honestly represent their opinion of the candidate. And if they do that, they might get undue weight. I mean, this was the theorem that we talked about a minute ago. It is possible in a voting system, in fact, it is inescapable that strategy can play a role. But we see that approval is doing pretty well, and approval is the only method on here, other than plurality, that has such an easy ballot. You know, if you've got 40 items on your, on your ballot, and if, I don't know, half of them are for candidates, and if a lot of those required you to have multiple boxes to do this instant runoff approach that, that we can talk about later, that we talked about a couple weeks ago, or some of the others, they're more complicated to work with. So approval is very simple and gets you uh, in the sweet spot in terms of 85% or more of the time, you'll do very well. We're going to come back to some of the others and we might come back to this. But um, this gives you a sense that there is a science of assessing election methods. A similar approach to this was done by Warren Smith back in 19, uh, back in, in 2000, uh, the year 2000, with similar results. This is a, a more polished simulation. So just wanted to give you a sense that, that there's some science, and I'll come back to some of the other methods. So at this point, I just want to point out that there are so many great opportunities to use approval voting. It makes sense to start at a local level to get experience in smaller elections where the stakes aren't as high. We often find politicians push back against, uh, against methods that might uh, not work in their favor, a natural thing. So we're planning to start small here. It's a great thing to do in a primary. A primary often will attract a wide uh, assortment of candidates, and this allows you to deal much more effectively with a wide assortment. I didn't say earlier on, but it's kind of obvious, if there's only two candidates, just about any election method is going to give you a great answer, you know, unless it's really perverse. So the problem arises when there's lots of candidates, and primaries are the sort of place where you get lots of candidates. And everybody wants to choose uh, the best candidate coming out of a primary. And having methods that reduce that contentiousness, that uh, are more about approving of people than about denigrating people, are especially important at a primary. Right now, just as in the United Nations and elsewhere, I think it's uh, highly usable by vacancy committees uh, and straw polls and you know, deciding what restaurant to go to for lunch. It's a very straightforward approach. Um, and I'm just going to point out that Colorado is actually a place that has innovated in the election world for a long time. We had a number of cities that had proportional representation in city councils starting in the first half of the century, Boulder from 1907 to 1947, if I remember correctly. 1917 to 1947. Um, Buckland voting was actually invented in Grand Junction and was used in a number of cities in Colorado and around the country. Uh, we've pioneered risk limiting audits, I'm delighted to say. And uh, in other state comparisons, we've done a lot of uh, innovative work. So we're kind of set up well to do approval voting. And at this point, I'd love for Jonathan to uh, tell us a little bit about a bill that, thank goodness, are you, you want to introduce Jonathan? Yeah. Okay. And, and then I'll have some more stuff if you want to come back. Thank you.
Representative Jonathan Singer is also here to speak with him, with us. He's been the representative from House District 11, my representative, since January of 2012. House District 11 includes Longmont, Niwot, Gun Barrel, and Northwest Boulder. And I was supposed to stop and remind everyone in Facebook land that we were still live streaming on Facebook about approval voting if you have just joined us. Prior to serving in the General Assembly, Singer earned an undergraduate degree from CSU in psychology and social work and went on to get a master's degree at CSU in social work. Then he worked for over a de decade with Boulder County's Department of Child and Family Services. As a legislator, Representative Singer chairs the Public Health Care and Human Services Committee, is the vice chair of the Joint Technology Committee, and serves on the local government. He is known as the sponsor of the bipartisan approval voting bills with Senator David Balmer, Senate Bill 65 in 2013, and House Bill 1062 in 2014. And I think maybe that's what you're going to tell us about uh, because you're sponsoring an approval voting bill this year as well. Is that correct? Okay, so Jonathan, please. and mostly accurate, which, you know, I think you talked me up a little bit better more than maybe I deserve, but uh, I am Jonathan Singer, and I represent Longmont and Iwat Lines in Allens Park, and in 2012 was also representing North uh, City of Boulder and, and also uh, parts of Gun Barrel, but redistricting took me out of that, but that conversation is for next month, if I remember correctly, so I'll give you a little plug on redistricting next time, but I, I think it's worked out. Um, so, I, I have been in the legislature since 2012, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, sitting in the state legislature as a social worker, I never expected to really be here. I never really, uh, I expected to be working in a department of human services for a long time, speaking up for kids, and uh, working with people struggling with addiction. And it was, it was interesting because one, one day out of the blue, I got a phone call and you know, my predecessor said, you should think about running. And uh, what I didn't realize is that in my thought process of running, I would actually be appointed to the seat even uh, months before I would actually even be elected. And when I finally got to the Capitol in January of 2012, uh, you know, not only was I dumbfounded, but people would come and say, well, you know, are you ready for this job? And I said, gosh, I don't know. I spent my career working with kids. How do you think it's going to go? <laughs> <laughs> so, so here we are. And, and one of the things I, I learned as a social worker, and I, I think this is really important, is that you have to sort of set aside your own personal biases. Uh, if you really want to get working with a family, you've got to set aside whether it's a bias against certain race or religion or just your own political affiliation or belief of, of someone's economic status, you got to put all that aside and say, okay, how do we get down to brass tacks? How do we make this work? And, and that is what I've tried to do at the Capitol is we sit down with Democrats and Republicans and we go, you know what, you know, the situation isn't working for citizens, so what can we do to bridge this gap? Maybe I've got to give up a little bit on my side, maybe you can give up a little bit on your side and we can make something work. Now, bipartisan success is passing a bill, and so the good news is the last two years that I've introduced a bill to allow approval voting to happen in our local communities, it's, we've had that success of having a Republican senator uh, who's, who's now uh, actually retired and, and myself as a Democratic House member running a bill, um, but it was also bipartisan in the sense that both Democrats and Republicans voted against that bill in the first committee. <laughs> so, so bipartisanship, I guess, is a two-way street, and um, I'm glad we could forge those agreements, but hopefully we can flip that this year. But what the genesis of this bill really is, is, it, is about doing the right thing at, at the most local level. We, with this bill, will be giving local communities city council races, special district races, school board races, the opportunity and the option of using approval voting as a method if 
that jurisdiction it so chooses. The idea being that just like our states are the laboratories of the nation, our local municipalities and school districts should be laboratories for our state. A lot of you probably remember uh, Proposition 107 and 108 from last year uh, allowing open primaries. That piece of legislation, that um, ballot issue that went to the voters was something similar passed in Washington State. And actually voter confusion went up in the first year. Ballot spoilage went up in the first year. And I won't go into all the details, but people weren't used to seeing, oh, okay, well I can, I can you know, here's the Democratic list of candidates, here's the Republican list of candidates, oh, and there's Libertarians running, and so there's that list. And, and so there was a little bit of voter confusion and actually ballot spoilage went up. And so in the effort to enfranchise voters, to say, hey, independents, you can participate in primaries, the rules of the game were, were confusing enough that, that actually certain people were disenfranchised by incorrectly filling out their ballots and, and having their votes basically nullifying their votes. So in order to, to avoid that, I think our, our local races should be the laboratories of our state. Maybe approval voting is the right answer. Maybe it's not. Uh, as, as much as you can run statistical models, the only model that really matters is when the rubber meets the road in an actual election. And, you know, you'll hear this in politics, the only poll that counts is the one on November 4th or November 8th, that, that first Tuesday in November. So now, now the question is upon myself and those of you that support this issue to actually make a difference at the Capitol. We don't quite yet have an introduced bill, but this is how democracy works. I learned a long time ago that if you don't represent your district, there'll be another person out there to do it for you. And so representative democracy means that each of us that believe in this issue, it's incumbent on us to reach out to our lawmakers, to make a compelling case, to do it before that first committee hearing. I always tell people, if you show up to a committee hearing and you and, and those legislators haven't heard from you before, either you've got a really damn good speech in that two or three minutes that you have to talk and you're gonna change everyone's mind, or they weren't paying attention at all in the first place and you've changed their mind or more likely than not, they've already made up their mind because they've heard from people beforehand. They've heard from dozens or hundreds, sometimes only tens of constituents that have said, you know what, Representative so-and-so, uh, Senator so-and-so, this bill is important to me and here's why. So, so this is, you know, this is actually, I know the Q&A portion isn't, isn't quite there yet, but I just wanted to do a, a brief poll of the audience. This is not an approval voting poll, but just a quick show of hands and I'll, I'll uh, reflect for, for you and audience what, what the hands show. But, but how many people have actually um, lobbied their state elected official that's in this room? So, so a good, good, good size of it here. So a so vast majority of folks in this room have done it. How many people here have testified at a committee hearing? All right, show of hands. How many people thought that was a positive experience? Okay, so we got, yeah, okay, I, we did a show of hands, I got a few fingers, just for a few minutes. <laughs> so, it, implied fingers, I won't, I won't say any actual, the league has always been courteous. So, so, that is the crux of this. How do we make this a valuable experience? How do we make this something that works? And this goes beyond just my bill in approval voting. And so part of that is all the homework that goes into this. And so I have a lot, there's a lot of credit to be shared here, whether it's some of the people sitting in this front row here with Frank and Blake, uh, Celeste, wherever you went, uh, wherever you are, with the League of Women Voters, with Common Cause, with, with all of these folks that have really taken the time to sit down with the interest groups that have an interest in A, Making sure that elections work. So people like our county clerks association, good, bad, or indifferent, if a county clerk can't make something work, their job isn't going, it, their, their job's not going anywhere. Uh, and, and they're gonna look pretty bad and they may not get elected. So we had people sit down with the county clerk, say how is this going to work, how is this not going to work? 
we've had people reach out to Common Cause and the League of Women Voters and other folks and said, okay, well, you're a recognized entity. How can we you know, leverage your membership, your expertise, your experiences to actually pushing this forward? Now, obviously, it hasn't gotten us over the finish line quite yet, but I also like to remind people, you know, good ideas take two or three bites of the apple at, at a minimum, at a minimum. And, and whether or not you uh, agree with some of the politics of the Capitol, the example I like to give folks is the idea that undocumented students that, that grew up here in Colorado would get in-state tuition was an idea that actually outlived the original bill sponsor's tenure at the Capitol. So we have term limits, there's only eight years, we've got a, a chance to make something work or not, and then you lose that institutional memory if someone else isn't willing to carry that torch. So over, over a decade ago now, a representative brought that issue up and it was only, only passed uh, in, in 2013. So that gives you an idea. You start something in early 2000 and, and it takes 13 years to get an idea forward. You've gotta be in it for the long haul. You can't just take your, your, your ball and go home if you don't win the first time. And so what does that mean? And so I, you know, what I'm going to do actually, rather than, um, rather than sort of drone on with, with the lecture here, is I, I'd really like to you know, continue with the program, but the question or the seed that I'm gonna plant in your head is, why didn't it work for you? What didn't work when you came to, to testify or you came to lobby? Because it sounds like you guys know who your lawmakers are, so you know, all of you probably learned where Project Vote Smart is or where the, where the state website is to find your local elected official. You know what their phone number is, those are the two really biggest bottlenecks that I've always heard is, you know, why won't the government do something about this? Well, who's your elected official? I don't know. Okay, let's start there, right? That's, that's why the government won't do something. They don't know who you are or what your issue is. Uh, the next uh, most challenging thing that, that I'm gonna plant the seed for you is that um, as much as it is that politicians got here one way, through, through a plurality system. It's not so much the reluctance to move away from plurality as it is that any new idea that brings uncertainty into the market of elections, any new concept is going to be, is going to be a challenge. It's gonna to be tough. And I'll, I'll give you two examples of electoral reforms that took some time. First one, I had a voter free registration bill allows 16 and 17 year olds to pre-register to vote so when they go get their driver's license, when they turn 16 or 17, they can fill out their paperwork so they don't have to go back to the county clerk's office when they're 18, they're automatically on the voter rolls. That took several years to get into place because there were, there were invested interests on all sides of the aisle that said, one, are these kids, you know, are they gonna be on the public rolls? Is this confidential? We don't want high school kids to have um, their names out there in the public sphere before they turn 18. That's a public safety issue, not so much an election issue. Um, and then, well, yeah, and the argument then was, well, this is just gonna benefit Democrats, because young people tend to vote Democratic, and so, uh, well, if you go to the, uh, actually, the Colorado Secretary of State's website, you'll actually see, and I don't know whether this is good or bad, but there's actually more Republicans who are pre-registered to vote than, than Democrats. I don't know what that says about me that I passed a bill that will ultimately you know, get into my own political obsolescence, but we don't always know what to expect. Um, the, other, uh, the other bill that took a monumental effort, once again, whether you agree or disagree with it, was the fact that now everybody in Colorado <coughs> gets a mail-in ballot. And you saw, this was a very, interestingly enough, the county clerks, even though they, they bought into this and, and there were compromises to get them to buy into it, um, and, those, and that is a bipartisan group of elected officials, it was still uh, largely Republicans at the legislature that were fighting this, saying, oh, you know, you're just gonna give the election away to Democrats now, you know, you'll see massive voter fraud, all of these things. Well, in 2014, who didn't win re-election? It was Mark Udall, right? So, so there, there is this uncertainty in the market of ideas, but fundamentally, I don't think you'll ever see another Democrat go back on the all mail-in ballot bill, even though it certainly didn't help 
uh, Mark Udall in 2014 because it's the right thing to do. And we hear back from voters who go, you know what, thank you. You just saved me a, a boatload of time. And, and so these are the different kinds of things that I hope that you think about and that you consider because these were not easy issues. These are complicated technically, they are complicated politically, and then on top of that, this is a new concept. When you go to the grocery store tonight and say, oh, you know, how was your day to your neighbor? They can go, well, I just heard a great lecture on approval voting. Great, what is that, right? Um, that's, not, that's not your kitchen table as well. For this group, it might be your kitchen table discussion. <laughs> for, for most other people, it is not your kitchen table discussion. But when you have the conversation, say, you know, aren't you sick of just trying to choose between the lesser of two evils? Wouldn't you like a method uh, that actually captures who you really care for? Wouldn't you like to know that that method of voting isn't going to spoil your ballot? You don't have to answer to these fearful attacks anymore? Those are the kinds of conversations that we can start to have and start to build this argument. So I'm going I'm to leave it at that right now because I, I'd like to um, see, see what else comes up today. But the seed I want to plant, and hopefully the questions I can try to answer for you is, what is it that, that didn't work with that? You know, it's one thing when, you know, I don't always vote the way my constituents want me to. I'd like to believe that I vote the way the majority of them want me to, but even in a year where I got 60% of the vote, still means that 40% of the people are gonna disagree with me. That's a lot of people, right? You know, we're talking about tens of thousands of people that by majority rule still feel like they're not getting represented. And, and so, it's frustrating for them, but hopefully I give them a good answer. Hopefully I respond to them and at least say, okay, yes, I was a no vote on your bill, and that you wanted me to, you know, you wanted me to be a yes vote, I was a no vote, but here's why. And so hopefully that, that conversation is productive in the sense that we can have a relationship where the next time that person comes to me and they say, look, I know you voted no last time on this bill, but here's another bill. And I'm gonna give you some good reasons if you give me a minute. So I'm going to leave, like I said, I'm going to leave it at that. I'd love to hear your responses, but I also want to move on with the program in, in respect to our time and our, our presenters here. So thank you guys. because, so if we go on to the next slide. Um, as a member of the Center for Election Science, I just want to highlight that things are sometimes more complex. We do have other opportunities. And there are some other things to consider. So if we were willing to modify the ballot, which I think is something that clerks are a little leery to do, it might increase the size of them, it might increase uh, the complexity, there are some other things, there are other methods that also look very good uh, when you look at them with simulation and when people think about them. I just want to quickly point them out. So there's something called score voting, which is actually just an extended form of approval voting. It's like in the Olympics or the Internet Movie Database. You give a ranking to each, uh, a rating. I said that wrong and that's crucial. You give a rating to each candidate. So you say on a scale of one to five or zero to ten, uh, how good do you think each candidate is? And then you just add all those scores up. So very flexible. You don't present voters with the dilemma of, do I give two candidates the exact same vote? Um, and it does very well in those simulations. It requires a little bit more space on the ballot. And approval voting to score with <coughs> two possible ratings. Then you can do the same thing, but you can add a runoff phase. You can say, let's pick the two best candidates on the basis of scores. And then let's look at the scores pairwise for those two candidates, and let's see which of those candidates was preferred over the other one. And this helps deal with some of the strategic manipulations that people try to do. So hasn't been used anywhere to my knowledge. There's actually a uh, proposal in Oregon, uh, the group moving forward trying to put that on the ballot in Oregon. Um, so it's a very interesting method that we can come back to. Why don't we go to the next slide. Three, two, one voting. 
Here's something that mixes in a bit of what everybody's um, kind of talking about in the election method community. Um, we start off by giving each candidate one of three ratings. You'll see three repeated ratings. So you give a rating of good, okay, or bad to each candidate. It's a little more expressive to the voter, a little more information than we all know. From that, you look at the three semi-finalists who get good support a lot. In other words, somebody has to actually rate them at the top at good, and you, you find candidates that have a lot of solid support. Of those, you eliminate the one that people say bad most often. So you eliminate the, the uh, candidate that gets a lot of negative. And then, just as in score runoff, you take the final two and you do a pairwise comparison. How many voters like candidate A to candidate B? How many voters like B to A? Or ties, you'll inevitably have ties. Yeah. This was the one at the top of that diagram I showed before. And it kind of gets around both the strategy issues and gives you a little bit more flexibility. Let's go on to the next one. And I really want to put in this plug. We're going to have a whole meeting about this. I hope we have great presentation. It's an enormously complex field. But when you have an entire council or legislature to represent people, I think it's immoral to have a situation where 20 or 30 percent of the electorate doesn't have a single representative on the council or in the <coughs> legislature. And that happens all the time, right? If and even, it doesn't have to have a party, but if there's a slate of people uh, available for a particular uh, political view or faction, and that slate can fill up all of the seats, you could very easily have an entire council or an entire legislature full of people who really just have one viewpoint. And 49% of the electorate, in, in principle, could be unrepresented. Who's going to show up to vote time after time if they get that kind of disrespect in the electorate? And I think that happens a lot of places. There are a lot of ways to deal with this. There's a system called single transferable vote that's widely used. There's a proportional version of approval voting with some beautiful mathematics behind it. It's not very complex. That was actually used in Sweden. Again, to the surprise of the person who recently reinvented it. There's a system called reweighted range voting. Range voting is another name for score voting. Um, that does some of the similar sorts of things. And they're actually using that in Berkeley. So just a taste of that, but Fairvote and Rob Ritchie made this point. A lot of people here have made this point. I think the first place we can make a difference would be go to the Boulder City Council or other councils in Boulder County and, and Colorado and say, Let's make sure that every voter feels that they have someone who's really on their wavelength. So final, um, oh, I, I do have a, a bit of um, responses to criticisms. There were um, various things that people have heard said specifically about approval voting. There's a concern that people might bullet vote. They might only vote for one. And my first response is, if their favorite candidate is one of the front runners, that's exactly what they should do. It makes perfect sense. They're already in the horse race just as strongly as they can, so that's not a problem. Our actual experience, we ran a poll in the Center for Election Science in November and actually counted uh, 2,000 voters with two different samples and said how many would vote for each of the either four or nine presidential candidates. And there was a lot more than bullet voting going on there. So I don't think it's a problem. And the simulations actually say it's a good thing if most voters bullet vote. So uh, I don't quite understand why that's been raised as such a, a criticism. I, it's, it's not a, a big problem, uh, I think, in practice. Um, and I would contrast it. In instant runoff voting, which hopefully people have seen because of the recent presentation, the problem there is voting for your first choice first can hurt your first choice. So it's in instant runoff voting, 
Your second choice is completely ignored, even to the point of making kind of a tyranny of the majority. If, if your second choice is ignored until they get eliminated, then that is not a, a happy situation for voters. Many of your, your votes are effectively not paid attention. So we can come back to this in questions. There's, there's a lot of weeds there. But let me just um, show you the data on this approval voting uh, poll that we did. In the nine-way poll, there were about half the voters, 52% there, that were happy with one of the choices and only voted for one. There were about 27% that voted for two. There were 14% that voted for three and 5% for four. And a couple beyond that. So pretty widespread uh, set of views. <coughs> and my summary is simply that um, approval voting is an obvious option to have in your arsenal. It's the easiest thing to uh, adopt. No changes to the ballots, no changes to the voting system. Um, if you want to do something that's more complex, I would go to something like score runoff or 321, or do more studies or do something. Uh, I think that the data shows that instant runoff doesn't perform as well, is more complicated, and has these really not very good results, and there's more information. Thank you. Thank you, Neil and Jonathan. Um, I'm Celeste Landry. I'll be handling the Q&A right now. And um, I wanted to start off by um, introducing Ron Tupa, former state senator. Would you wave your hand? There is an alternative voting bill that has passed in Colorado. It was House Bill 8-1378, and Ron was one of the sponsors for it back in 2008. Um, it, has, it allows ranked choice voting in um, municipalities and special districts like uh, fire districts or water districts. And uh, it took two tries. They tried in 2007, it didn't work. And then in 2007, although it didn't work, they created a voter choice task force and one of our speakers from next time is probably going to be one of the members of that voter choice task force. Another member of the voter choice task force was Senator John, but he was then Representative uh, Kafalas. And he's now Senator Kafalas from Fort Collins, and he is a co-sponsor with Jonathan Singer for the approval voting bill. So he's in favor of not just one particular kind of better voting method. Um, the 2008 bill uh, began with cities, so also a small step. Um, and there's a thinking that, as uh, Neil said, you don't, uh, we could start with city councils, like Boulder City Council, because Boulder is a home rural city. So perhaps we don't need Jonathan's bill for to make things start happening now. So who knows the order of how things will happen, but we could all be working from different angles here. Um, so here's the first question. Um, instant runoff voting and single transferable vote, the multi winner version of that, were approved for local municipal elections in 2008 by the Colorado legislature. Why do legislatures, legislators keep saying no to an approval voting bill? Why indeed? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think this, this goes back, and I, you know, I'm actually a supporter of term limits, but, um, but this goes back to one of the, the downsides of term limits is that we lose some of that institutional memory. And so, well, Rep Representative, now Senator Kapalas, obviously was around in 2008. You know, what year is it now? It's, it's 2017. And so if, even if somebody had voted for something in 2008 and um, finished their tenure, their entire term limits in the Senate, their entire term limits in the House, they're not there anymore. And what does that what does that really mean? We have legislators sort of ceded 
their institutional memory too. Unfortunately, it isn't former legislators because legislators aren't allowed to lobby for at least two years after they've, um, they've exited the General Assembly, but it is the lobbyists. And so this, that's the first problem. The second one is that as much as the problem is pretty sexy, I mean, everybody really, we, it is, right? You know, yeah. everyone hates yeah. the, the lesser of two evils, right? This is the clash of the titans, right? The, the problem that we've described is, is one that everyone gets immediately. The solution gets pretty wonky pretty quickly. And, and so when, when, these, when it's not a bright, shiny object, it's not an easy solution, when it, when it can be described, in, in a sentence or two, but it's challenging to sort of get people over that intellectual hump without showing them. It becomes a much more challenging conversation. I think this, the second thing is that, oh, I guess we have a citizen lobbyist here too, so. Um, I, I think the other, the other uh, <coughs> issue with this is um, that it, it's not a, a top button issue. It's, it's not a top button issue for folks. You know, when people are looking at things like the opiate epidemic, or oil and gas drilling. And, and those, those are front burner issues. This one is still on the back burner for legislators. Paul. I have the short answer to that, and the reason is is because you, the voters, haven't called. Yeah, it's your fault. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because well, voters haven't called and said, pass this bill. Well, it's a two-way street, right? I need your support. And I need people's support in other house districts other than mine because when people call me, I feel really good about myself. I already know which way I'm voting. So, um, but but it's a, I've got to be able to communicate the issue enough to voters so that they are interested, and then voters have got to reflect that back to their elected officials. Oh, ah, okay. You want me to start calling people out? So, um, so all, most election bills go to the state military and veterans affairs committee. Uh, so the state military, so I got a few strange looks. Why, how is this a military affair, right? <laughs> so um, the reason it goes to this, and it is the appropriate committee to send this to, is because elections are a state affair by, by definition. And the state affairs committee actually oversees the Colorado Secretary of State's office, which oversees elections. And, and so uh, our State Military and Veterans Affairs Committee in the House, it's a majority Democratic committee in the Senate. If it makes it that far, it'll be a majority Republican committee, so we're gonna need bipartisan support again. Uh, the actual chair of that committee represents this district, uh, Mike Foote. So uh, there's one, uh, and I can't name all the, all e. off, the off the top of my head. Yeah. Boulder, uh, also Edie Hooten, another Democrat. And um, so that's that's where the conversation begins. So let's we'll take a get look. we'll get the names and and are you looking them up? And we'll um, let you know. Okay, um, I wanted to say one thing uh, that you said that you were appointed to your seat in 2012, but you were elected by a vacancy committee, which <laughs> could have used approval. <laughs> well, there were only two. There were only two candidates. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so you were but still you were elected. Okay, uh, next question. This one's for Neil. Let's say that approval voting was successful and became the standard for presidential elections. How would this affect the Electoral College? Would the Electoral College be eliminated? That's the first part. And the second one is, would this eliminate caucus voting? I think they might mean primaries, because he said we would no longer pick one down and one Republican. So, um, Interesting, very interesting question about the Electoral College. Um, I, first of all, it wouldn't affect right now <coughs> no other changes to the Electoral College at all because actually a state can use any method that it wants, including having the legislature just decide how to um, determine the delegates to the national uh, convention to the, to the Electoral College. Um, but there is a proposal, as many of you know, for for a national popular vote. And the approval voting would work pretty well with that. Ooh, thank you. Um, it would be 
a little complicated because, of course, you would expect more votes for a given candidate in uh, an approval voting election than in other states that didn't use approval voting. So you would probably want to address that either by doing something proportionally or with some other method, or it might just be a great way to give hints to the other states that they might want to adopt approval voting. So um, the PACT ought to address questions like that. It's way more complicated for instant runoff voting. And by the way, I, I want to say that I'm a great fan of just about any method other than proportional. So I, I didn't, plurality. you know, plurality. other than plurality. You know, instant runoff, I'm thrilled that Maine is going forward with that. I see great uses for it. I see complications with it. I think there are better things, but, you know, I'm not meaning to detract from that. And delighted that Rob Ritchie is hoping that our bill on approval voting gets passed. He sees that as a, as a good step forward. There was a second? Yeah. Um, caucuses. Oh, caucuses. They might have meant primaries. Well, so primaries, caucuses, you know, preliminaries to uh, party processes. Um, you can see it going either way. It would make sense to me to just have a single election once in November with all the candidates that want to show up as soon as you have a method that is able to deal with lots of candidates. Having runoffs is the sort of thing that people like, and it might also be an advantage to have a multi-stage affair and to narrow the group and then proceed. So uh, I haven't seen a lot of real informed opinion on that, but it gives us a lot more confidence. Uh, I get to do little commercial breaks in between speak in between questions, and this one is: uh, We are having consensus meetings for the league on Thursday evening and and Monday afternoon. Right, Monday. Monday. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and there is a study packet that just got posted on the website. It's comprehensive, I hope. And um, I, a lot of the things that are talked about today are on there, including even 3-2-1 voting is mentioned in there. Um, something else that's mentioned, um, you mentioned that Oregon is interested in score runoff voting. Oregon, the Oregon League's position on alternative voting methods is very broad and supports any alternative method. So, <laughs> I, uh, so I think that's something for us to think about too in our state. Um, so I would encourage everybody who's going to the consensus meetings, the league members in particular, to check out that voting methods study packet. So here's a question for Representative Singer. Um, the 2008 legislation approved of use of IRV, instant runoff voting for single winner elections and single transferable vote for multi-winner elections in municipal <coughs> elections. This is a working sample that legislators have. Would it help get the approval bill passed to just repeat that language, substituting approval for single winner and proportional approval voting for multi-winner in municipal elections? Sure, let's give that a shot. Um, no, uh, you know, I, I think that the, uh, to just do a copy and paste wouldn't work anymore because there's a lot of things that have changed in election law since 2008. So we've got to make it fit. Um, it really was less of a nuts and bolts argument. I, I give a lot of people in this room a lot of credit for working with the County Clerks Association to, to make that work. Um, this is, is a, a more of a philosophical question at this point than anything else. To the extent where it is a nuts and bolts in question is people go, well, look, if you're a home rule city, you can pretty much do whatever you want, right? And um, the response that I heard from at least one Littleton City Council um, or city attorney is that without specific guidance from the Secretary of State's office, from the General Assembly, that um, they wouldn't be able to implement other methods of alternative voting other than the ones that are currently allowed with single transferable vote and uh, ranked choice. Uh, next little commercial announcement. After this event, uh, if you'd like to continue the conversation, uh, Neil and I don't know about you, Jonathan. I got a little kid to put to bed. Okay. So. <laughs> um, Neil will be at Chili's, which is uh, just on 
Highway 287. If you head out of here toward 287 and head north, it'll be on your left-hand side. So we'd love to see you there. Um, it was good last time, wasn't it, Ron? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm not just tonight too, so I can't go. <laughs> I, I heard there the bill got picked up by somebody last time. <laughs> Did everybody hear that? The, the, the bill got picked up by somebody last time. Nodding and dashing. Okay. And then the last thing I want to say is that this is part two of a series, and we're planning part three, which is going to be about proportional representation. So um, some of you asked a question. We might not get to that one, but uh, come back. We think it's going to be in April. We don't have a date. April 18th. It's booked now for April 18th. They're reserving the date for April 18th. We have to check, make sure the speakers that we think are speaking are also available that day. Okay. Um, the next question. Is approval voting different enough to break the current environment of partisan ballots? In other words, bullet voting based on party and a perceived need, need to vote tactically. I don't know if you feel like you answered that already or you want to say anything more? Well, I think I would say that um, these things are very hard to know. A lot depends on how things are covered, on how people um, decide to think about them and write about them, how legislators respond. My sense is that um, in some other countries, even other single winner methods um, haven't done a great job of you know, moving beyond two parties or, or opening things up. Um, but it's very clear to me that it's a movement in the right direction and that it quite possibly could here or in other places. And um, just the effect that it would have on primaries, if it's used in primaries, could be very beneficial. So I think there's a lot of upside, um, kind of regardless of how over time in various places uh, it works out in the, in the electoral process. It's hard predicting the future. That, that's really hard. So right now, approval voting is not used, as far as we know, for any uh, public governmental elections in the United States. But this year, Fargo, North Dakota, um, their electoral commission is recommending that they use approval voting to elect their city commissioners. So that keep, keep your eyes open for that. Okay, question for Jonathan. Based on your description of the bill you're working on, are we to understand that as cities and counties who are not home rule, that state level legislation is required for people to be able to even choose to implement a change to voting methods? Yes. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, and that's, I mean, this is sort of politics 101, um, or maybe local government 101, but in, in Colorado, we actually give a lot of local control to um, our, our cities, a fair amount to our counties, but counties are known as political subdivisions of the state, with a couple exceptions, and even cities and towns. So for example, the town of Lyons, which is a statutory town, not a home rule municipality, a lot of things default to the state. Um, and without sort of, and, and whether or not this is, this is lawyer talk now, but one of the issues actually might have been the fact that we as a General Assembly passed an IRB bill, and so now there's sort of this assumption that you almost need a bill to guarantee or to, to give authority to municipalities, counties, or, or other um, election districts. Um, the other thing that I'll just point out with the, the uh, question given beforehand is that um, the Republican National Committee is actually getting somewhat interested in this, and, and this is probably the first time I'll be <laughs> excited about it, but you look at the primaries last year on the Republican side, crowded field, right? Who won but almost never got a plurality? The president. Um, and, and so a, a very sort of sobering you know, perspective there, but also maybe an opportunity to get better representation. Okay, uh, another question for you, Representative Sager. How do you perceive approval voting would impact two-party deadlock in Colorado Assembly and the U.S. Congress. Does approval voting promote third-party wins? Well, it couldn't get much worse, could it? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
No, I, well, I mean, the one thing I want to point out is that, you know, at the General Assembly, um, you know, we've got our good days and our bad days, but, you know, my first year in, in uh, 2012, we had a budget vote. We have a balanced budget every year. We have to very carefully negotiate this stuff. There are 65 members of the House. The budget that year passed 64 to 1. Uh, I wasn't the one. Uh, but, but and, and the person who was the one, actually, you know, he's in the Senate and now the majority leader in the Senate, actually. And we passed bills together. Uh, and so we for the most part, actually askew a lot of that partisan element, and I think it's actually because we're closer to the voters. You know, where you're in Congress, you've got 700,000 people you've got to worry about. You're running for the United States Senate, you've got five and a half million people to respond to. They, a U.S. Senator can't respond to every single constituent email they get. It's just not possible. Um, or if they did, they wouldn't actually be doing anything else. Which might be an improvement, actually. Now that I think about it. So, so, but but fundamentally, um, what I think this will do is this will um, engender better faith in our electoral system. You look at the fact that people elected a lot of people elected or voted for someone they didn't like, whether you're right wing or left wing. The approval ratings of the two top candidates not super high, right? And, and so maybe maybe this is a way to, to crack that egg, to really you know, broach that in a, in a new way of a conversation. And like I said, starting at the local level, and I think it was actually Blake that brought this up the other day, but when you're looking at a city council race, let's say you've got a city councilor that's been in that seat for a long time, they're thinking about retiring, and you know, there's a new up and comer. And you know, as, as an up-and-comer, maybe you don't want to challenge the incumbent because you're seen as stepping on someone's toes and then some, you make someone else angry. But in, a, in, a, in an approval voting situation, that up-and-comer, the, the city, city council member might say, you know what, I'm not gonna be here in another two years or four years, I'm, you know, I'm gonna retire. But, you know, Blake, I really like you. Celeste, I really like you. You guys should throw your hats in the ring too and not feel threatened by those folks, but get an idea of what the general population wants. The second thing I think that you'll see, and, and this may, may also crack that egg in a certain sense of it, is, is the fact that we'll get, uh, as an elected official, I'll get a better sense of how many of my voters, even, even if I win, how many of my voters, well, I hope I win, but it, when I win, that how many of my voters also really liked one of the other people running. And so I can get a better idea of how to represent my community because I go, okay, well, look, I, you know, if you put this in, in uh, partisan, sense, partisan sense for a second, I, you, know, I, I, you know, I beat the Republican, I beat the Libertarian, I beat the Green, but gosh, there were sure a lot of Green votes. Like that Green almost, you know, almost overtook me in, in, in a certain respect. And, and that, you know, and libertarian, they were really close too. And so I'm gonna have to start listening to those green and libertarian ideas a little bit more, and maybe not so much the Republican, or vice versa. So I, I think that it has an opportunity to change that conversation, but this is a nonpartisan bill. I think it's really important to remember that. Fundamentally, this is a nonpartisan bill, but let's not kid ourselves. Nonpartisan races get very partisan. And, and so this is an opportunity to, to turn that script around a little bit and give elected officials a better sense of who else the voters might like. Introduce yourself, please. Um, I'm Paul Tiger. Uh, I've uh, written this bill three times. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> with, with some help. Uh, so yes, it's a, it's a nonpartisan bill. But I'd like to point out that I'm sorry, sir. That in 2000, I don't need a microphone. Are we recording this? Being yes. recorded. Yes, we do. That in 2006, uh, the uh, the Democratic Caucus in Boulder decided to try it out as a as a, a straw poll, and I know that they've done this a couple of times. Except Bernie kept winning, so they stopped. So they stopped doing it, right? <laughs> uh, so um, I. Uh, I think that the uh, best place to see this in use uh, would be in, uh, in caucuses. People who are, uh, look, you've got a, a wide field of candidates uh, at, the, at the grassroots level. Choose now or don't get a choice later. 
you really you won't get a choice later. Um, so I think that a, a great place for approval voting to start being used is in caucuses. And by the way, uh, a few of us went to the Western Conservative uh, Summit in Denver, and uh, they used a, 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 a both a plurality and a, a approval voting uh, to choose a running mate uh, for the uh, uh, Republican, the guy that's there now. <laughs> the Republican nominee at the time. Yes. And may I continue just briefly? <laughs> uh, Introduce yourself. My name is Frank Atwood. All the way over to the side so they can see you. Okay, sorry. I'm, my name is Frank Atwood and I happen to be Approval Voting USA and the sponsor this evening. But at Western Conservative Summit last year, at Western Conservative Summit last year, the question be asked was who should be Trump's running mate? And what was amusing was with plurality voting, Newt Gingrich came in first, Ben Carson came in fourth. With approval voting, Ben Carson came in first, and Newt Gingrich came in fourth. Most of the time when we've conducted polls with Western Conservative Summit, the results are the same regardless of the method used. But this illustrates, I feel, when it's broad popular support, Ben Carson was reflecting a broader popular support than Newt Gingrich, who did win plurality. So let me thank you all. All thank of you, you uh, Frank Atwood was also the presidential candidate for the approval voting party in Colorado. And my with running mate was Blake. Running mate, Blake Hewer. <laughs> Yes, and Neil McVernon and Paul Tiger were members of his, were electors for him. If they had happened to win, they would have gone, Neil and Paul would have gone to the state capitol. Like yes. Celeste did. I yes. did yes. in the electoral colleges here. Okay, I just lost the page. Would you bring it back up? Um, I'm going to tell you the names of the people on the state military veterans committee so that you can contact them. Are we sure that's updated because it still has retired that's actually from 2016. Yeah. I posted it on the video, but it came from the Colorado.gov. Who's retired? Um, Diane Primavera. No, she's not on here. Yeah. So this is a Mike Foote is the chair. Susan Lontine. Yes. Uh, is the vice chair. Adrian Benavides. Edie Hooten, who uh, represents part of Boulder. Stephen Humphrey. Tim Leonard. Jovan Melton. Mike Weissman. Jovan. Milton, Mike Weissman, and Dave Williams. So if you know any of them, contact them. Contact Edie Hooten because you live in Boulder County. And, and, and tell her, you know, when you look her up, find out everybody else. We should maybe put some of that information on the website. Um, I think uh, we're about done. I wanted to say one more thing about um, Congress and bipartisan be more bipartisan. Last time our speaker spoke about multi-winner districts for Congress. That's something that FairVote is working on. And what you would do is have two or three districts in Colorado and you would elect from each district two or three people. And um, they're talking about trying this out with Virginia and Maryland. It's called the Potomac Compact. Sounds fascinating. And I'm going to turn this back to Bruce. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. I wanted to thank Jonathan and Neil for being here. And thank you for coming to a League of Women Voters event. And we hope to see all of you at the next event here at the library on April the 18th on proportional representation. Uh, it'll be on our website, and also go <coughs> to our website at LWVBC and look up the uh, very comprehensive study packet that the, our voting methods team has developed. So you want to look at that packet in for further education on this topic. So thank you very much for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you.